Um, for the last talk of the year, we tried to save the best to last. We got shame. So, this is brilliant. This is exactly what you learn when you're coding and things are going well. This is, you just do your job and nothing new happens. And it's just, you know, it's, it's rubbish. And then something goes terribly badly wrong, you have a heart attack and you panic and you fix it. And you learn a lot while you're doing that. Um, and uh, uh, we, we, we like learning in your form, we like making ourselves better. It's one of the things that differentiates good coders from bad coders, constant improvement and focus and getting better and better and better. Uh, but, but we found people who weren't making enough mistakes to get better. So we decided we'd share mistakes. And share it and, and uh, yes. we called it a scare Halloween, the worst coding experience and the worst coding mistake you've made all year. We had a competition in the company. And I don't think then she has actually won. No. no. But anyway. I'm not sure it's not her dream. Maybe I just tell you. I will uh, I'll let uh, Shane see the rest of the talk. Yeah. Nice walking. Yeah. 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 Uh, so apparently the first step is admitting you have a problem. So, I'm Seamus, uh, I'm a software developer. <laughs> <laughs> so this isn't a talk about Node uh, or JavaScript. Uh, so sorry if you've been misinformed, but there's free beer and pizza, so uh, you can't really complain. Uh, so as Paul mentioned there, um, our CTO, Richard, organized a team building exercise for Halloween called Coding Horror. Um, and the objective was to talk about uh, the worst code, some of the worst code that you'd ever written. Uh, so for example, one of my colleagues uh, recounted how he spent two days debugging a problem, only to discover that he'd actually broken the breakpoint mechanism in the system. <laughs> so of course he was setting breakpoints, waiting for it to hit the breakpoints, and then it all went horribly wrong. Uh, so yeah, it took him two days to realize that this was going on. Um, but I kind of sidestepped the objective a little bit. Uh, uh, why? Because it's very difficult. Uh, it's very difficult to look at your own work uh, and pick out the flaws. Um, it's very easy to find examples of bad code on the internet, hence coding horror. Um, but it's really hard to actually look back at all the stuff you've done and just try and pick it apart. Has anyone actually done that? Yeah, it's, it's quite difficult. Um, I'm 100% certain that I do write horrible code, but the problem is I just don't know that it's horrible. So I'm going to talk about it. So I couldn't talk about any of those. Uh, so yeah, I cheated a little bit. Um, <clears throat> uh, so what I actually showed was a mixture of bad code and bad habits. Um, so here are some of them. So I do a lot of uh, front end work. Um, a lot of the time there, kind of prototypes or minimum viable products. Um, so the interface is evolving really rapidly. There might be some competitors in the market that are doing exactly the, the same thing you're doing, going after the same customers. So you just need to get something in front of potential users and investors. Um, probably changes radically every week. <coughs> so the next iteration could be totally different. Um, and if you had the luxury of time, you'd probably go back and just redo the layout, do it differently. But you don't have time. so. You just have to get it done. Um, the situation is compounded if there's multiple people working on that CSS. Uh, so if there's an agreed strategy for uh, organizing your CSS, it eventually will descend into chaos. Um, something that I've done myself when inheriting a kind of a very uh, approach type that had been had, had a little bit of development, um, and where there was obviously a style.css, but it was going through a redesign. Um, where most of the system was going to be changed. So uh, I added a style to that CSS with the intention of carrying over the style that was on the, the interface that was remaining the same and adding the, the new styling in style to that CSS. So yeah, this is purely temporary and uh, I'll totally remove this later, uh, but it doesn't always happen like that. <coughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I can be. Um, Quite lazy as well sometimes, but the same applies if it's a prototype, you just need to get it done. Maybe uh, some, some bad habits leak in there. Um, that's there aren't legitimate uses for important, of course, um, but often it's a sign of code smell. Um, <clears throat> so, this is usually my 
response to all these? I promise I'll, I'll, I'll fix it, I'll come back to it. Um, maybe a little bit of time will, will pass. Uh, something else that I catch myself uh, doing, not necessarily related to a system that's been developed, but more like kind of administration or housekeeping or uh, something like that, say there's a one-off task where you need to take data from 20 spreadsheets and transform it a little bit and stick it into a database. So here's the usual uh, thought process, my thought process. Um, so option A, you just do it manually, you open up files, copy paste, drag and drop, global replace. It takes 10 minutes. We're engineers, we don't, repetition is our natural enemy. Uh, so option B, conduct some extremely focused research. Uh, your years of experience uh, and wisdom and your finely tuned instincts as a software professional allow you to rule out some of these uh, very early on. Uh, after evaluating the remaining options, then you make an informed decision that doing it manually uh, was probably the best option. Um, and then you do it manually. And it probably takes about seven times as long as uh, the first option. Uh, something else, not reading the manual, you notice I've used a little book as the, the icon for this one because I think apparently in the olden days people looked stuff up in books. Um, so here's an actual code reading example. Does anyone use Angular? Do you love it or hate it or somewhere in between changes on a regular basis? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so basically in Angular you can define routes uh, and you can pass in a map of dependencies to eject into a route. Um, uh, so they can be just, you know, just raw data, or they can be functions, or uh, if any of them are promises, uh, then the, trans the transition won't actually start until the promises are resolved. So here uh, I'm using a, a stop service to make a request to an API using Angular's HTTP service request and stuff, uh, so that the transition can start. Um, but of course, uh, Angular's HTTP service already returns a promise, so I could have just shortened that to a uh, single line. Um, but that was me just not really taking the time to A, read and B, understand the documentation properly. Um, so, the availability of online documentation is kind of a double-edged sword, really, because um, yes, it's very accessible, but it's also really easy to find inaccurate, outdated, um, misleading, and just plain wrong examples. Um, also reading documentation, it's not very rewarding, <coughs> is it? Uh, technical documentation can be very hard to ingest sometimes. Crappy formatting, subject matter is pretty, pretty boring. There's no narrative, there's no, there's no hook. I've never heard someone say, I was reading some documentation on Friday, I just couldn't put it down. Um, <laughs> maybe also it's a, it's a male thing as well, of possibly not wanting to ask for directions. Maybe that also applies in this scenario. Uh, like I know a guy who bought a, a shredder in Audi uh, and immediately shredded the instructions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, something else I'm guilty of is just reckless copy pasting. So trying to solve a problem, you remember that you already wrote something to do that somewhere else uh, a couple of weeks ago, so I'll just copy and paste that in. Um, but I'm lazy, so uh, not even realizing that, you know, most of the functions in the, in the file use CV for callback, when the one I basically use is done now. Yes, of course, that's a pretty trivial example that it works perfectly, there's no difference in terms of logic, but it's laziness and uh, it's smelly. Uh, and I'm usually kind of OCD when it comes to that kind of stuff, like even line breaks between functions, if there's one and then the next function there's two line breaks, I don't even like that. So uh, when I catch myself doing this, yeah. and Anyway, when I, I realize that I'm copying and pasting a lot, um, I should just learn that it's time to write an old module because that's, we all know that's the best way to reuse code. Uh, and again, my attitude like this is like, yeah, like, of course I'll, I'll come back to it. But, uh, so something else is like, not testing enough. So again, my favorite environment is Martin, MVPs, prototypes where testing really isn't, there's not a huge emphasis on testing. You just want to get a happy path working. Um, it's threat first, you want to get stuff in front of potential investors and users. So yes, it could be really easy to break, but 
functionality exists for people to decide whether they like it or not. Um, but the current project I'm working on, uh, there's a really great testing process, really high coverage, and it's actually very satisfying watching all the tests scroll past. So I just need to learn to, to embrace, embrace testing. Um, I'm going to get some content for this, uh, but then I started looking at Markdown based presentation tools and they started tweaking the styling and they started looking for icons. Uh, why? Because it's much easier to do all those than actually come up with material. So, uh, so this is all very negative. I'm just beating myself up here. What's the point? What's the point of our coding horror exercise? What's the point of me doing this talk? Uh, well, it's pretty much all about self-improvement. So, as a software developer, uh, at least in my personal experience, you can't stop learning. There's always going to be new frameworks. There's, as soon as you get up to speed with something, somebody else is already halfway through writing something that, that supersedes it and is more performant and more usable. Um, but that's actually something that I love about this career. Um, and speaking of learning, if I can just take you on an aside into psychology uh, that I read on Wikipedia. Um, this is a, a theory called the four stages of competence. Um, and it suggests that when you're learning a skill or a concept, you go through these four steps. Um, so you can kind of paraphrase these as you don't know, you don't know, you know, you don't know, you know, you know, and you don't know, you know, which is kind of but that means it's kind of second nature, the last one. Um, and they suggest that that's a linear journey, right? So you, obviously everything goes towards the, the fourth one. Um, but you can also think of this as like a, a pie chart of four slices. So that every concept or skill that exists is going to be in one of these four slices for you. Um, so the first slice, that's pretty dangerous. Um, that's what crashes planes and loses companies millions of dollars in short spaces of time. Um, I see a lot of drivers who apparently don't know they're supposed to use indicators when uh, changing lanes or turning. Um, and then the fourth slice, that's not really something you worry about because, yeah, it'd be great if everything made it down that far, but for the majority of people, this is going to be by far the smallest. Like, I think I have walking, riding a bike. Um, I'd love to have, have ten fingers typing in there, but that's I don't think that's going to happen. Um, and stuff will go into the fourth one from the third one just by repetition and time. There's not much else you can do to affect that. So it's the middle two, a really sweet spot. Uh, and the most important transition is from the first one into the second one, because the second one is pretty safe. Um, and it looks bad. The word incompetence looks bad. Uh, and especially as a software developer, you often feel like you can't admit to not knowing something or not knowing how to do something. Like, hey, have you used uh, pancake.js? Um, yeah, yeah, I think I've used that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that actually exists, by the way. I just made up a, a silly word to put JS on the end of it, but it exists. Uh, so what can you do to move stuff from the dangerous slice into conscious incompetence? Because if it's in that slice, you can, you can easily avoid it, or you can make a conscious effort to, conscious, pardon the one, uh, you can make a conscious effort to get better at it. Uh, so one way is to just consume as much as possible, uh, whether it's whatever your, your go-tos are, hacker news, meetups, conferences, blogs, newsletters, etc. Uh, and consume might be the wrong word because you don't actually have to ingest this stuff. You just have to be exposed to it, I guess. Uh, and yes, you do have to dig through mounds of irrelevant and boring stuff, uh, or save it for later, or whatever, um, uh, which can be very overloading, but I kind of find this to be a bit compelling as well. Like if I see, again, any random word with a .js at the end of it, I'm like, ooh, that sounds interesting. <laughs> Could be totally random. Um, and this also applies to node modules. Because yeah. we're at, does anyone know how many modules we're at? It's over 100,000, I think, anyway. So. How can you possibly discover these things? You just have to consume as much as possible. Um, and this also applies to reading the manual. Uh, so again, you don't have to ingest everything. Uh, it's like an open book exam. Like you only have to remember enough to know 
what you need to look up uh, and where to look it up. Like there's some stuff I have to look up the syntax for every time I go to use it, but if it only takes three seconds for it to appear on the screen, is that so bad? Uh, <clears throat> so a couple of the things that I've come across in my travels to alleviate some of these afflictions that I've described, uh, one of them is shame.css, which um, I think Chris Coyer and two other guys kind of jokingly came up with, but then realized it was actually a great idea. So <clears throat> when you have to use these horrible CSS hacks, you create a file called shame.css, you put them in there and you document them really verbosely as to why you had to do it, what would be your preferred alternative. Um, so then they're obvious to everybody. They don't slip through the cracks, people don't end up building layers and layers on top of these things. Um, I haven't actually used this myself, but it's, I think it's a good idea. Um, regarding documentation, um, devdocs.io, um, it's really good. You can, you can search across 30 different APIs or something like that. Works offline, uh, and there's a Sublime Text plugin, of course, um, so you can highlight a word and uh, go directly to a search. Um, something else you can do, your request for self-improvement, um, peer review. and. The most convenient way of doing this is using GitHub pull requests, I think, for most of us. Um, the icon is two speech files because this works both ways and it's supposed to be a discussion. So it's not just the executive vice president of engineering reviewing all the minions code. It's like everybody can look at everybody else's um, and either learn stuff or teach stuff. Um, sometimes pull request discussions are purely negative if you're like, you know, you could have done this in one line rather than five lines, or you should be using this, or you know, you should be using this module instead of this module. It's like okay. so last year. Um, but I think there's more room for positivity in these uh, uh, pull request discussions. So instead of just a thumbs up or a plus one, you know, you could do. You did it much better than I would have done. I wouldn't have thought to do it that way. That's pretty cool. Um, but another big reason for this coding horror event. Um, that I took away from it uh, is related to imposter syndrome. Has anyone come across <laughs> imposter syndrome? Uh, so imposter syndrome again is one of these things that have been given a name, but you know it's, not, it's not an actual disorder or anything. Um, but this is when somebody is convinced um, that they're a fraud and they don't deserve the successes they've achieved, despite any evidence to the contrary. And many successes that they do achieve, they attribute to luck or being in the right place at the right time or something. Um, so if you're lucky to work with talented people or like you watch a lot of conference talks or you attend conferences or you follow the work of some, some of these open source gurus who are like can obviously slow down time because they or they don't sleep because they're so prolific. Um, I think you probably identify with this at some point, I know I do. Um, and the thing with imposter syndrome, it's gonna get this weird feedback loop because just because you think it applies to you doesn't necessarily mean that you're not actually an imposter, that you're not actually bad. So when you learn about this, it actually makes you more paranoid. <laughs> <laughs> and it just keeps building. So what the coding horror event is really good for was sharing your own flaws and mistakes with other people and hearing about theirs. And I think it's a pretty effective treatment for this. And everybody benefits. And it's actually quite satisfying to share this stuff. Uh, so, final thought, um, make more of an effort to find your flaws, um, but definitely don't think of it as a negative process, because every time you find a mistake that you've made, you're actually becoming a more competent human being, because you're moving stuff from the first slice, which you can kill people in, <laughs> into the second slice, which is totally safe. Um, also, just be more open about this process, I mean, there's no shame in realizing you've made mistakes. Um, share what you've learned with other people um, and we can possibly eradicate imposter syndrome um, and just keep learning and improving and enjoying yourself. Thanks very much. Can't imagine what you want to ask me after that. But <laughs> to bring along the worst no code they've written. Would you do that if we asked? Could you do that at your company? I don't know, anyway. <laughs>
One way, yeah. All right, sure you do. Yeah. Well, we, we might have a chance. We'll see. Might be interesting to get to you. Yeah. We have just open source the project, and hmm? there is plenty of bad for because uh, our mindset is a code that work or a code that is pretty. So we will have month of code just looking at that. <laughs> Really? Well, that, that, that is definitely two types of engineer. <laughs> For me, I, I'm, I'm, since I was born, I'm pragmatic. It has to work, it has to work, it has to stay, it has to stay alive, it's what it's supposed to do. I know lots of people who will not release code unless it's also beautiful. Which is <laughs> um, a whole different world. Mr. Peter Elder. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Bell is. Huh?